All right, I'm with Chris Munro. Uh, we're discussing the article, Why Teacher Autonomy is Central to Coaching Success and Coaching a Bit More Broadly. Um, just as a forewarning, Chris, I'm trying to go a little bit broader than coaching or, or be very specific because I feel like coaching as well as teaching is something that it's very easy to talk about in the abstract without examples. So um, how would you, how do you introduce yourself to people who aren't familiar with the type of work that you do firstly? Oh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, how do I introduce myself? Um, first and foremost, I, I usually say I'm, I'm still an educator. I'd like to say I'm still a teacher, but some people would strongly disagree with that. Um, somebody in a program once said to me very kindly, you're still allowed to call yourself a teacher, Chris, because that's still your professional qualification. And I thank them profusely for that because I still identify as, a, a, as such a part of my identity. So I'm an educator, uh, but now I, I work with I work with other educators to help them uh, improve the quality of the conversations they have with each other. And the way we do that is through through coaching and coaching approaches. So, um, working with school leaders, working with teachers, doing coaching training, but also still doing coaching for school leaders as well. Uh, but all of my work is is in in education, predominantly in school settings, but increasingly a broader uh, definition of education contexts, yeah. Right, and so the, the last time you are on the TER podcast was in 2016, oh. and you just, your last uh, kind of part of the podcast was you saying that you were off to uh, try this um, yeah. coaching business. Yeah. So, you know, almost four years on now, how uh, how has that gone? Uh, Where are you at now? That's amazing that that's so long ago. Yeah, I was stepping out of school um, for the second time in my career, I stepped out into university for five years before I came to Australia and then came back into schools here. And that was stepping out again out of not comfort in a cushy way, but, but the, the familiar, you know, and uh, the annual leave reduction and all those kind of things. But listen, I, I frequently say, Stephen, I, I've got my dream job. I get to do what I love doing. Uh, I get to immerse myself in, a, in a, an area that's become a specialism that I'm really passionate about. And I get to do that for a living. That pays the mortgage. Um, so without being seen as going to the dark side of consultancy, as you and I joked about earlier, uh, I, I still feel as I'm in, in and amongst schools and educators and amongst my people still. Uh, whereas there's there's a lot of um, vendors out there selling shiny things to schools. Uh, I, I'm quite fiercely uh, defensive that, that that's not what we do at GCI. Uh, and I'm now lucky enough to work with people closely that that were academic heroes back then when I was doing it in school. Um, so people at Jim Knight, you know, mm -hmm. who, who I now get to converse with regularly and, and would call a friend and a colleague. So it, it has that that trajectory has panned out really nicely. Obviously, we're in challenging times right now, uh, the, the same as you are in schools. Right. Uh, but I still feel as though I'm in and amongst schools and school leaders and making a difference just from a different angle. Right. So in the um, the edu reading group that um, we run, we often speak about mm. edu gurus. Do you want to just share your 10 cents on, obviously, you're in that world, you're in that kind of space. Um, would you consider yourself an edu guru? Um, is that a, a dirty uh, word in your industry? How does do you know, it sort of... I, I still, and it is the pass. teacher bit in me, I still bristle even the words like in your industry. Like I'm, I'm sad you or or products <laughs> or... But you know, as but I said that, know, I sort of no, caught but myself. But you're right, though. It, it is. It's, I, I, I quite. I have to be quite open with this. That what I do for a living now in coaching, or and all my colleagues and consultants and so on, um, it it's what the job is now. It puts food on the table. But that your first question, yeah, I do bristle and I did cringe at the edu guru thing. I think I, I if myself, I certainly wouldn't put myself there. Uh, but certainly some would say, you know, Christian van Neuerberg, Professor Christian van Neuerberg is my boss. He's the executive director of the company. Um, he's also still an academic. There's a nice bridging way that we're operating as an organisation that we've got a foot in practice still through the work we do in schools. We've got people who are still academics, still doing writing and research. I get to dabble in both of those and we do the training. So I'd like to think we were unique in that sense. But I think both Christian and Jim, Dr. Jim Knight, uh, and John Campbell, uh, our founding director, people would see them as world thought leaders. Professor Rachel Lofthouse, who's in partnership with us at the University of Leeds Beckett, they're world thought leaders in the field. But I know each one of them would balk at the term edu guru, and they don't want to be introduced at conferences mm. as the guru or the expert. 
uh, they know a bit more, they've done some of the research and that's the way they would position themselves. And I think that's something we need to hold on to because it's part of what we would call a coaching way of being. One of the main characteristics you need to be an effective coach or even an effective professional developer um, is humility. And when you meet these people, the humility shines yeah. through. Even though you know they've got the books, I've got a pile of them sitting here behind me, you know, um, that doesn't come across in how they interact. So I, I want to hold on to that and, and try and stay grounded. And I think as soon as we don't, we run the risk of being one of those edgy gurus who's then wheeled out for the keynotes and good luck to them. I won't name names and you won't name names, but uh, I, I don't see us in that space. But listen, we bring a lot of expertise to this and a lot of wisdom, but it's how it's conveyed, I think, and how it's shared through partnership with the education communities that's important. Mm. Yeah, for sure. <coughs> All right, so let's kick it off with the first one. First question we've got here. Um, so my impression is that, uh, you know, maybe in an ideal world that coaching would be sort of the primary means of professional learning or some sort of human and relational aspect would be the core part of it but um as we know to lead on from our edu guru discussion i guess it's um a lot of it is sort of large uh educational mm. conferences and it's most things are done at scale rather than in a personal one-to-one -one relationship um is that how you see it like do you think a more developed or a more mature educational system might be more open or more active around coaching um the, there's two things there the, the word the word maturity is an interesting word. Um, I think it's it's maybe um, maturity might be in that sense acknowledging the complexity of the work and genuinely acknowledging the complexity of the work and then the complexity of the work means that we need a broader range of um, professional learning options or avenues for professional educators whereas a, a less mature or more simplistic view is basically one size fits all PD they don't know what they don't know. We'll just spray it at them and tell them. Um, the Americans call those kind of PDs, you know, sit and get PD or spray and pray is my favourite. You know, just spray stuff at them and hope some of it sticks. Mm. And you and I, I don't know how long you've been teaching, but certainly anybody who's been teaching any length of time has been subjected to quite a lot of that kind of PD. Um, and, and the hope mm. is that some of it will stick. And, and you might sit there and be really enthused, really engaged, you might be listening to one of your edu gurus on the stage and you think this is fantastic and I'm really inspired, yet you go way back to school with your show bag and I've still got some sitting on the shelf here behind me. You don't find them again until you move office and you go, I remember that conference, that was great. <laughs> but did you actually do anything with it? Yeah. Did you change anything in those deeply ingrained habits and practices? Probably not, more often than not. And, and actually Michael Fuller and Andy Harvey's others have been saying this for decades that that traditional PD is is problematic and it's a huge waste of, of money at, at worst. Um, so I think, yeah, maturity for me, the word maturity would mean a more sophisticated, nuanced understanding of how adults learn. I think we're in danger of teach, treating teachers like students and our empty vessels. And um, the highly directive top-down mm. approach to PD doesn't work for a whole number of reasons. It's not very effective in getting the message across. It's efficient on scale from a numbers point of view, but in terms of individual contextual implementation of the new learning, assuming there was new learning, uh, requires one-to-one -one support. And there is solid um, scientific research around that. The ones that are most cited is Joyce and Showers, Showers and Joyce studies in coaching, where it was about implementing particular strategies that had been taught traditional PD. And they found that when you partnered with another uh, knowledgeable adult, and it looked very like coaching early on, um, the, the degree of implementation and sustained implementation rocketed um, because you had that one-on-one -on -one contextual support in there right next to the action. The challenge with traditional PD is it's, it's separated from the action. We can't create praxis through that, that link between your actual real-life context and the new learning that you're doing. So we're often guilty in education of detaching the two. And you've got to sit there in a workshop or you've got to sit there in a conference and imagine what this would look like in your world, in your class, not just your school, in your classes uh, in any given day of the week. Um, and all those factors just don't play into it. So you need support. And we know that coaching is an effective way of doing that. There are other, others, highly effective professional learning communities, a degree of mentoring. You know, we're not saying one's good, one's not good, but those kind of more personal supports, localised supports, 
are often what makes the difference in terms of implementing something that might have been a good intention when you left that PD that never quite materialises in action and sustained action. Um, so I think if if that, I'm not sure if that well, answers your you question mean? or what you mean by maturity, but um, I think the it's the mature view at all sorts of levels from politicians, policy makers, school leaders, right down to teachers and how they think about professional learning. Maybe if that was more joined up and sophisticated, right. maybe maturity would be a word I could, I could go for. Yeah, it challenged me. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. I was um yeah. just just this morning I was speaking to. Um, someone that participates in the group, Dr. Mm. Paul Heary mm -hmm. from the UK, and he was basically saying that um, coaching doesn't happen in the UK, and he's um, mm. a principal or a head teacher, mm. as they call him over there. Um, and if, if it was happening, he would have known about it. Um, and at least my impression is that this, they're more focused on their research and their CPD yeah. and their kind yeah. of research yeah. ed kind of um, personal, internal yeah. development yeah. processes maybe. Um, whereas we're a little bit more okay. open to coaching in Australia would be my broad I, sweeking statement. I, I don't think know if that you're probably right, world, and people like Christian Van Neuberg would tell you that that because um, he's based in the UK. Um, Rachel Lofthouse will tell you that as well. So one of the people I would I would put I would direct you to there. Um, coaching is happening in the UK and has been for a long time, but it's probably not getting the profile that it's had here or in America. Uh, certainly, instructional coaching is not a big thing in the UK yet. Um, but the reference there would be uh, uh, Professor Rachel Lofthouse, and that's at uh, Leeds Beckett University. She runs the Collective Ed group, so it's a bit worthwhile. You guys connect in there as well. Uh, and Collective Ed is the uh, mentoring, coaching, and professional learning hub at Leeds Beckett University. Uh, and they have open access papers and, and think pieces and things that they publish. But that would be a good way of getting a handle on what is happening in coaching and mentoring in the UK. Uh, and it's, it's really flourishing just now. Mm -hmm. So it is, but I think Australia is is at the leading edge of this. Uh, America has, has more evolved around instructional coaching in different ways on scale. Um, but certainly a lot of the innovative work and different applications of coaching is happening in Australia. Uh, just now, I think that'd be a fair, broad statement for you right. for you to make. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's all. That's all. I, I start with a broad <laughs> statement, and you take it from there. Um, all right, so the next one's a bit of a challenge, I think. In a world enamored with impact, how would you counter the perception of coaching being a low yield intervention? And so by that, obviously, we're thinking sort of big picture mm. data. Um, we're looking for, you know, students to jump up certain quartiles yeah. and so forth, uh, whereas coaching is by definition one, yeah, one to one. So low yield again, yeah. And, and the word impact, I agree. Uh, there is a, a world enamored with impact and um, the what works agenda and, you know, um, which can become very reductionist, prescriptive. I have all those anxieties. Um, my view here is coming very much from a, from a teacher autonomy point of view, but we can say more about that later. Autonomy doesn't mean a free for all. Doesn't mean teachers pick their own adventure. We all work as part of a system. We can challenge, we can nudge. We should have a voice in that system, but there will be constraints around teachers work. And there is a lot of research and an increasing amount of research around um, what might be more well-founded productive strategies than others. I'm kind of echoing Dylan Williams' take on it there, rather than it tells us what works and you should all just do this. Uh, I don't subscribe to that. But that notion of impact that then when you implement these strategies or you operate in a particular way in a school or you offer coaching or mentoring or any other kind of intervention or you do your, your big PD, which there's still a need for to sow new ideas, to, to challenge people, to push thinking, um, can you make a causal link from that right through to student outcomes? I think that's the holy grail that politicians and others would lead, love to see. But I think um, uh, anyone who uh, is properly tuned into the complexities of the work of, of educators knows that that's probably an unattainable uh, target. I think what you can do, and we have seen studies emerging that show um, sustained in, impact on impact on, I'm hesitating even as you use the word, influence on uh, teacher practice, teacher yeah. practices. And then the word sustained is important there as well. Um, 
there was a, a, a meta-analysis done by um, Matthew Kraft and David Blazar. I, couldn't, I don't have the actual citation here in my fingertips, but uh, a couple of years ago now, I think, uh, where they looked at, and it was based in America, uh, they looked at a whole range of studies of coaching, and it was instructional coaching, so it was around particular high-impact practices or high-yield strategies or well-founded, whatever language you want to use this week for them. But those things that are perceived to work more often than not, um, I hope I've been tentative enough with that. Um, and they did find links through, uh, a through line through to student outcomes. But it was, it was, you know, it wasn't, you know, completely convincing. There's more work to be done. But they also highlighted some of the issues of coaching at scale. And some of those I recognise are around the quality of the coaching, of the coaches, uh, the access access to the coaching, because it's a resource intensive thing compared to your one size fits all PD. Um, but so in terms of yield, it depends what you're measuring. And it depends on who you're asking. Uh, but I think it, I don't think that discounts it as a strategy. Um, I think mm. it's becoming much, much clearer what happens when you do that top down. You'll all just teach this way and you treat teachers like trained monkeys uh, and all of the theory around motivation Will, will tell you that that doesn't work and not that it doesn't work it makes things worse so it, you know it links to things like teacher retention and so on there's actually a whole load of other benefits to to respecting teachers and supporting them one-on-one -on -one. but still against a backdrop of yes we do know a thing or two even though the work is complex that doesn't mean that's not a defense to say well who's to tell us what works well we do know some things are more well founded than others is that a, is that a suitably soft way without it being so soft that it means nothing um, but what are those practices that we know in that setting at that time in that study seem to have a higher degree of effectiveness than the not and I think that's the discussion you're stimulating mm. through your edu reading group which is great you know at that, and the more of that the better because uh, it all sits against that how do, how do teachers engage with research is it written for them or not written for them? I think that kind of bridging thing that you're doing here is really, really valuable in that. But then who curates that? Who chooses, you know, what counts and what doesn't count? So there's a whole... Uh. But I think if we're trying to trace yeah. coaching, those teachers were coached and therefore those students... Live. There's an emerging body there, but it's it's just as hard as is tracking the impact of any other professional learning intervention because you can't eliminate all the other things that are happening in the school at the same time. It's really hard to do control trials on that kind of intervention. Um, so th there is some out there, but it's still, I, I get it can be challenged uh, on, on those impact grounds right. yeah, or yeah. what works grounds. But philosophically, that might depend on which mm. which kind of camp you subscribe more to uh, as to how willing you're, you are to be yeah. flexible and, and go with it and see what happens. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your mm. question, Stephen. You've got me yeah, rambling just, again. Um, <laughs> it, it does, it does. Um, the context is kind of um, uh, my wife and I are involved in an organisation that develops oh, teachers yeah. in Cambodia. And so for 13 years we've been, as an organisation, yes. that's been happening. Um, and it's only kind of quite recently that, you know, we contact organ other organisations and they sort of say, how do you evaluate mm. impact? Um, and I think the core, the core two things are, sort of professional learning is such a black box of we're not exactly sure if professional learning mm. as you said is the holy mm. grail a through line to mm. student I student impact and then also uh teacher quality so you know if i if mm. i you coached me it would be a better example mm. than me coaching you for sure um and then my view of the world changed and then my practice right. has changed as a result it might right. be like you know a three-year lead time but in three years, I might have a much worse class or a much easier yeah. class or vice yeah. versa. And there's so many and I think other factors. Right. And I think, I think oh, when, and there's an attraction for school leaders who are under pressure from the next level of whatever system it is above. And this is one of the commonalities we see right around the world, that they're responding to a, a form around them. And they're trying to create that form around the work of their teachers in schools. And, and increasingly, the more controlling that is, the less autonomy teachers perceive themselves to have. Um, but if I asked you, you know, if I could give you your dream professional learning situation that developed the, the kind of teachers you want in your school, depending on who you spoke to, you might get a different answer because the politicians might say or certain senior leaders might say um, the kind of teachers I want are ones who get 
the top scores or the top this or that, and they'll measure it in different me different metrics. Um, if you said to me, I want teachers who feel like thinking professionals, who feel hopeful for their future and the future of their kids, that might all sound nice and warm and fuzzy. Politicians won't like those kind of measurements. Um, but I'll tell you now, that's that's a couple of the key outcomes from me of meeting a teacher where they're at. Um, I think one of the figures you would see coming through there is teacher retention increasing. Uh, people feeling more autonomy, more professional trust, uh, more of a degree of influence on their work. Um, for me, that's the kind of professionals and profession that I would want to be part of. Um, that then we do need to make a leap of faith to say that's likely to result in better outcomes for the students you know and sometimes the wrong thing is driving this and it's the measurement of the metrics and the results and the attainment and the published data and so on and I think there's also some things sometimes that happens with teacher standards and so on that things that were actually intended to professionalize the profession the way they are then administered uh, or implemented ends up inadvertently deprofessionalizing or making teachers feel deprofessionalized and I feel really strongly about that, that that's a place where coaching, even within that context, without me being an activist and having to challenge and fight the fight, which is all good, um, I still feel that in my class, where it's me and my kids, I have enough degrees of freedom and degrees of influence, and I can see the, the change and the, the enhancement in their learning and opportunities, that I still feel like a, a worthwhile professional. I think coaching has the power to do that, um, but capturing the measurement of that is not always going to satisfy leaders, you know, that accountability for the, the cost of the mm. intervention. Um, but I think that's the power of it. Yeah. Uh, we can see it at quite a high level. We can see it at a superficial level that teachers are enacting new things. But fundamentally, they're going to hang around and they're going to have their skin in the game longer um, if they really feel like they're making a difference. And that's what we all want as human beings. So I think there's a deeper philosophical standpoint we need to come from here when we look at these as interventions. You know, I even bristle at that word because uh, an intervention is like a treatment mm. to fix things. You know, so we've got these broken teachers and coaching will fix yeah. them. Well, it will, it will die a death within a year if that's what comes through as the rationale for it. We know that from experience. Sorry, I, you've got me off again. Mm. <laughs> My soapbox. Well, I'm just thinking, ju continuing on from there. So autonomy, um, one of the key ideas from the article mm. we're broadly discussing is sort of that um, autonomy is something that's required. And I guess that's the, the, the question mm. about maturity as well is sort of saying a, a mature system allows autonomy, autonomy in its teachers. Um, and whether autonomy is a prerequisite for coaching mm. or not, or whether it just makes it easier um, I mean, if we just use the UK as an easy example, so I'm a teacher there and I've got Ofsted coming in and sort of with a clipboard, relatively speaking, they're yeah. ticking and crossing. Uh, I, I would imagine that coaching would still work there. It just might have some, um, I don't know, almost bad PR to get through in the sense that if you came as a coach uh, without the clipboard and you were observing my practice, mm. the kind of the system would maybe give them give me the wrong impression that you were there for a ulterior yeah, motive uh, you're, you're, uh, yeah the the Ofsted regime in, in england and I, as a scot as a proud scot i'll correct you there Ofsted doesn't exist across the uk it only exists in england that's all right no no that's no. okay that's okay. just my yeah, bugbear. Right. that's okay, okay. <laughs> none taken um but yeah it, it's probably the worst manifestation of of top-down uh compliance driven uh trying to trying to give the public confidence in these uh, perceived hopeless educators out there. And we know it's far from that. And uh, you know all the press around what happens in schools and some play the system and get teachers to jump through the hoops the day the inspectors arrive and lo and behold, they get the outstanding grade and so on. Um, but literally that's about as high stakes as you could get uh, in terms of a, a, a you know, measurement and judgment and so on, because your school role can literally yo-yo according to what you get. You know, People vote with their feet. So to say coaching could still work there, um, I think you highlight a really important tension there. I don't think you can be appraiser, and that is really is appraise, appraisal, uh, judger, and it's really high stakes judgment that happens in Ofsted. I don't think you can do that and say, and by the way, I'm going to be a coach as well. Uh, we need to really clearly separate out those functions. If you took that down to even a school here, 
where you have a, a review and appraisal system, if you have that, or a performance and development system where technically in the Department of Education, your next pay grade depends on it, but we never enact that quite rightly. Um, but the if you don't delineate those, there is a, an unhelpful tension that does get in the way. You know, if I'm your boss and you know that, that I can hire and fire you, uh, or I can cap your pay and not let you go up the increment next year or stop you getting that promotion, you're going to tell me what I want to hear. It doesn't matter if I say, now, now Stephen, I'm taking my leader hat off. I want you to see me as your coach for this next half an hour. You're going to go, yeah, but eh, how candid am I really going to be? Um, now, I've seen it work where the relationships are really strong and the trust is really high and there's a lot of cultural things around that in the school. But it can really get in the way. So the measurement, appraisal, judgment, public accountability, I'd rather keep them separate and I'd rather position coaching, mentoring, professional learning communities, any other professional learning service that you want to provide in your school to your staff as just that. It's a professional learning opportunity and its aim is professional growth. And its aim is to build your sense of autonomy. That doesn't mean you can do what you like. It means that you feel you have a sufficient degree of control over your work to feel as though you're making a difference. So you get those things about feeling like you're competent and getting mastery and getting better at doing what you're doing, which is motivating. Uh, you feel as though you've got enough degrees of freedom and enough choice to be able to feel like a thinking professional and not just a trained monkey who's teaching to a script. Um, and and that doesn't include, Jim mentions it in his article, it doesn't include the degree of choice where you can say, look, I'm not a morning person, I'll just come in at 10 o'clock. That's ridiculous. But So it presumes a level of professionalism and it presumes that things like compliance, mandatory reporting, all those other necessary things in schools, public accountability measures, it presumes that they're all there and in place. So autonomy can be a risky word sometimes that it sounds like a free-for-all and teachers just pick their own adventure. I think it's helping teachers see the degrees of choice and have as many degrees of choice and freedom as is possible within the system that, that they work. Uh, but I think those those extreme top end, top heavy things like Ofsted and so on, um, they completely undermine that, you know, that you're always going to have that suspicion of weariness. I could coach you in terms of how to jump through the hoops for Ofsted. But I don't think it's going to make you feel like a, a more worthwhile professional. I think it's just going to help you get through that hurdle that's coming up next week that you'd rather not have to do. I could help you cope with it. Uh, but I don't really think that's really how we want to be spending that resource in a school, is jumping through performance hoops. Um, I, think, I think it's the wrong measurement. It's the wrong metric again. Um, I hope someday we see the end of that kind of regime. But yeah, that's that's I'm hopefully been really clear that we need to really separate those as interventions but some in power uh, John John Andrews and I friend John Andrews in Queensland we wrote um, a chapter in uh, the Flip the System Australia book uh, last year year before maybe now mm. on coaching for agency and that's one of the things we said there that one of the cautions is um, coaching should be used for the powers of good not the powers of evil uh, it, in the wrong hands it could be used to manipulate people and to drive an agenda uh, I think it won't last very long because teachers will see through it. We're very perceptive. Um, so, uh, but it, it could be used and implemented that way. And you'll get people coming to your school saying, oh no, you do coaching here. I've had that. And I'll say, hang on a minute. It's a good thing. Oh, not what I was. We had coaching and it turned into this and it became that. We were told it'd be confidential and then it wasn't. So how it's led and how it's initiated and the clarity of intent and the degree of autonomy and what we mean by words like autonomy and agency and so on, and then walking the talk, uh, I think they, those are all really important factors here. It's not just we're going to do coaching now and we're all going to coach or here you've got this service. I think all that messaging around it and seeing it through in your school context is what makes it work and stick around or just become another fad. Oh yeah, we did that. I remember doing that PD. Remember we all had to do those funny conversations for a few months and then it all fell away. You've seen so many, I'm sure the same as me, so many things like that over the years. My worry is that, I don't think it is, I think coaching's hanging around long enough now that those who get it, get it and see what it is. Where it doesn't hang around, it's it's because it's been seen as a fad and it's been conveyed that way and there hasn't been enough depth of understanding or resourcing to make it stick around. 
again, I'm straying off topic here again, Stephen. You're, you're just nodding politely no, as I ramble good. here. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just trying to pick up the thread. So yeah. let's go to, so you mentioned your piece in yeah. Flip the System Australia. That's yeah. something that's relatively overtly activist, I guess, by, by nature compared yeah, to your average yeah. edu book. Yeah. Um, so I guess, and I mean, you mentioned agency before rather than autonomy. So you prefer the phrase agency than autonomy, but I feel like um, it's often in our political landscape and such as it is um, that teachers are required to be mm. activists. I mean, I know the the language you're using is more around navigating and sort of mm. facilitating and working yeah. within the structures. Yeah. Um, how would you see the role for activism, which is sort of activism. more flip the system approach, which is uh, step one, yeah. understand the structure, step two, attack challenge yeah. something like that back. i don't know because that activism was a very that? trendy thing. i've got a book somewhere there i can't judith Sachs was the as an australian author i remember when i was at aberdeen uni one of the mm. texts was the activist profession i think it's called i can correct that later i've got it there somewhere it was actually one of the mm. course texts for our teacher training program um i remember one of the lecturers right. that i worked <laughs> with talked about creative subversion it was a lovely term teachers should be in we shouldn't be recruiting teachers in our own image. We should be looking for people who've got a bit of that tendency to shake up the system. I'm quite sure that will horrify the politicians in, in most Western governments right now, um, which I don't think is a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but I think that I think that the whole rationale of the flip kind of movement uh, was such a privilege to, to be part of that is was to elevate those voices to say, look, this is a very capable thinking profession. I think... I don't. I, I'm not sure where I am on it, Stephen. I'm not anti it in any way, shape, or form. But I think if if we have a profession of activists who all have, and we see it on Twitter, we see it with the uh, the traditionalists and the neo traditionalists and the neoliberal and and the the really toxic. I wouldn't even say debate and discussion. It's just a right argument and and. Uh, it's horrible some of what happens there. But that's what happens when they, each of them, I'm sure, would describe themselves as uh, activists. Um, so I'm not saying that needs to be controlled by the system. or control, uh, But how do we elevate teacher voices? How do we elevate respectful dialogue around what's actually happening on the ground and how things have been played out? How do we build trust in the profession? And I don't mean perceived trust and public accountability. Um, like standards and things are supposed to do uh, and Ofsted's supposed to do um, but I, you know I think there is because there's a, there's a danger that uh, if we don't encourage that voice uh, which you might call activism that we just keep recruiting in our own dimension we just keep being a, this self perpetuating thing um, but there's extremes of that aren't there? There are movements around and there are people who might be seen as edu gurus pushing on one agenda or the other, um, but I think there is a. I, I get the impression certainly I've I started teaching in ninety two, and I don't see much difference around the world to be honest in terms of the agenda, the political movements. None of the none of the Western governments are covering themselves in glory right now, uh, in education or otherwise. So, it, the commonalities for me are teachers working with teachers, leaders trying to lead a bunch of adults. Um, teachers stand in front of a bunch of kids or sitting in front of a bunch of kids trying to get the best out of them. Those fundamentals don't change the world over, but what does change is the shape of the politics and the system and the requirements and the accountability measures around them. And I think if we if activism means that teachers have more of a voice in shaping that politically, uh, then that can only be a good thing. If activism means I can um, grind my own axe to my own ends, for my own hobby horse, then I think that can be really disruptive in an unhelpful way. I think the common ground is what we need to be trying to find in terms of what we're striving for. Look, I'm not an expert in that area, and it's but that's my own personal view in terms of, I'd like to see more common ground being found in terms of what we do agree on than mm. those kind of divisive conversations that actually don't make the profession look good anyway. And again, I'm talking to you here as though I'm still a teacher, aren't I? Um, I still feel invested in it, you know, not just as a parent or anything else. I still feel yeah. really invested in that, that there's so much intellectual capacity out there in the profession that we're not tapping into and we end up deprofessionalizing. 
with some of these measures. I think that's the short of it. Mm. But yeah, I'm all for activism. But I suppose the cautious bit in me is <laughs> how and what would the constraints be around the limits of that activism? You know, because you do need a system of some sort, mm. some kind of framework or guiding principles. And I'm sure academics have been trying to establish mm. those for many, many, many decades or, you know, uh, yeah. Hmm. Do you know? It sounds like, yeah, it sounds like though you agree in principle with activism mm. having a role that kind of all, I don't mean, you've said the word mm. humility a lot of times. So it sounds like part of your core impression of coaching is that it's a uh, it's humilitous. Hum, 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 humble and I, I think you're it's, right, actually, that I should be, my stance mm. needs to be one of humble inquiry, respectful curiosity for you. But if I was coaching you in your school, mm. and let's say I was called the instructional coach, um, I bring things to the table. Right now, you and I coaching each other as, as both experienced uh, school leaders. I know a little bit of what your kind of leadership role is in your school. I've been similar kind of head of faculty department kind of roles. So you and I both know stuff about how to run teams, how to do certain things in school. And we sit down and one of us is taking the stance of coach. Um, I still bring things as another adult professional to the table. But if I start delivering that and giving you all my helpful advice and all my opinions straight off, what I do is I take away your sense of autonomy. I reduce your voice. Uh, you feel as though I'm putting myself one up on you, so you're more likely to resist and we won't have a positive relationship. So in being the coach, I've got to really manage my own voice and I've got to manage when to deploy the stuff that I know that might be useful. Because my experience is from my experience in my world, in my professional contexts. I can't stand in your shoes. I can't even say I know what it's like to be in your shoes. I think I know what it's like from what you've said. But I can't be sure because that's not possible. So I think coming from a really deep belief in that's the appropriate stance from which to approach a fellow professional educator means that you have to be humble and you have to really self-manage, which is why it's pretty hard work intellectually coaching because you're busy trying to tune into them and be really present, but you're self-managing the whole time as well. Um, but if I saw you stuck, I saw you struggling, I saw you about to throw in the towel, and you needed help from me, and I thought I knew something that might help, it would be very disingenuous of me not to offer it. Um, so I've got to do that in a respectful way that doesn't make you feel like an idiot for not seeing what I saw, uh, and put it in very tentative provisional language to you. So it's not that I sit here and it's all warm and fuzzy, just making you feel better. I have stuff that might be useful, but I can't be arrogant enough to assume that I know best because you're the professional in your context. So I think that's the humility thing, and it also links strongly to autonomy, to you feel in a sense of control, influence, choice, those words all come up. Um, you mentioned the agency, there is a bit I would say there about that, that what that word does is it brings together the other term that often comes up in coaching is around self-efficacy. You can have a really strong sense of self-efficacy. You can believe and know from past experience that you're a really capable leader of a team in a school, for example but you've just moved to a different environment or you've just had a reshuffle in your leadership structure and all of a sudden some of the things in your contexts have changed and you're not able to act in the same way in that context as you did in your previous. So you can still know you've got it. You still know that you can do it, but you're acting in a different context, a different ecological environment. Like, um, so if... Hmm. And I'm just pulling pulling threads together here. So... It sounds like your your vision of coaching requires or maybe at least often features expertise and humility. Um, so if you were to run a How To Coach 101 mm. workshop um, and <laughs> let's say I, I turn up and I'm very abrasive and unhumble and uh, inexperienced, overconfident, all of those things, um, how mm. does the coaching methodology let's say, if I'm perhaps not the ideal candidate that you would have in mind as a coach, how yes. how does yes. how does your approach okay. respond to that sort of a person? Okay. So there's another couple of tensions there. Yeah. So one is the tension in the coaching between my voice and my knowledge and your autonomy and your voice. 
So there's a tension there of knowing how and when that I might need to intervene. And if I'm too knowledgeable uh, or think I've got too much or I'm in too much of a hurry, I might overpower you and, and you know take it, you know, not be humble enough or curious enough. But you're right back to your, your you're kind of asking a question that often comes up in our training workshops. Um, can anybody be a coach? I'm often asked. Often it's followed with, can anybody be coached? Or is everybody coachable? That's a different question. There's another answer to that one. But can anybody be a coach? Um, I think everybody can follow a process and could have a more structured, managed conversation than you're currently having. You could all do it in quite a mechanistic way. Uh, it does it get to really deep coaching where it's that stuff about it's actually changed me as a person and, and uh, it's really moved me somewhere philosophically and practically in my work as an educator? Probably not. No, I don't think everybody can be. Uh, when we talk about the uh, what it takes to, to coach effectively, we talk about three elements. We talk about, well, we talk about the growth framework, but some kind of conversational process that it's a it's a managed conversation. So a good coaching conversation does have a structure. And if I'm leading it, part of my job is to manage the shape of that conversation. And we'll use the growth model to do that. There's other ways of doing it. Um, if equally the coaching cycle has a, a framework, a structure around it, so it has a formality to it that, that we both know what we're getting into. There are key coaching skills. So clearly my ability to listen and to ask powerful questions and the kind of questions and the way I clarify that I'm hearing you right and you know, the way that I build trust, all these kinds of things, what I notice, how present I am. There's fundamental skills that you can learn and practice and get better at. So those first two, you can practice, you can work on. But the third mo mo important one is way of being, coaching way of being. Uh, Jim Knight would describe that. He'd say the parallel in his work is the partnership principles, which really govern how I show up in the conversation. So the way you experience me in the conversation, what it's like on the other side of me, is of a fundamental importance to how successful our coaching endeavour is going to be. Um, and that requires me to have a high level of emotional intelligence, to self-manage, to be self-aware, to be very aware and empathetic to how you are and what's life like for you right now. Um, if I've not got that, and I'm not seeing the need to work on that, then it's very hard to turn that person into an effective coach. So what you need to start there is raising their awareness of what it's like to be on the other side of them. And one of the powerful ways of doing that is 360 evaluation tools, use of video. One of the best ways to become better at this is to watch yourself coach. Um, so you can get better at it, but it is a tougher gig when you get people coming in saying, no, 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 I just need to tell them. Surely that's the most efficient way to do it. I know something that's going to be useful. No, no, it's going to be a train wreck if they do that. I, I just need to tell them. And they need to understand what's actually going on in the human adult to adult dynamic at that point that they're reducing that person's voice, they're taking the, the ownership from them and they're actually positioning themselves one up in that person. And they're less likely to get buy-in. They're more likely to get pushback or just passive compliance at that point. Uh, and it'll actually erode the trust in the relationship, not enhance it. So I think when you're helping people to become coaches, and I think that word becoming is important, you become a coach um, and you become more coach-like in, in all your interactions, I think that's a sign of somebody who's really got it. Uh, whereas others, it'll be quite superficial, you know, um, which is a worry when teach schools say, we're all coaches. We've done this one day training program. Now we all go off and be coaches. Uh, you're not, but you might have slightly more structured conversations if you really stick at it and keep thinking about it. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of issues under that one, Stephen. But I think short answer, no, not everybody can be an effective coach. Right. Everybody could probably go through the motions. And is everybody coachable? Uh, you didn't ask that, I raised that, but is everybody coachable? I think everybody has the potential to be coachable, but you're only coachable when you really want to change mm. something. I can't force you to want to change something yeah. in your practice. Um, so if you come as a customer for change, something you want to do differently or better, a coaching conversation can help you move right. it to there. Uh, but it, it won't convert you. I can't coach bad behavior out of you. That's right. for sure. You know, unless I'm conscious yeah. of your time. Um, last last yep. question. You've got four minutes to answer it. No pressure. Um, so the current situation, at least from my perspective, has seen uh, a real dev devolution in the sort of leadership structure of a school. So kind of the mm -hmm. sort of middle mm -hmm. category of your sort of 
whatever they're called all across Australia, they're called different things, but the people that aren't principals or assistant principals, and they're not full-time teachers either, the people with sort of liminal roles between there. Um, from the research I've done and my experience, a lot of the work that is mm. done by those people is sort of corridor conversations, informal uh, things that look a lot yeah. like coaching. Uh, in the current situation with everyone working from their uh, you know, studies, bedrooms, etc., um, do you think there's a particular role for coaching or for those types of middle leaders to um, exert this type of conversation? Yeah, I, I think there's there's more of a need for coaching and the co formal coaching and the, the e online equivalent of whatever corridor coaching is. Yeah, it might just be a check in rather than accidentally bumping into somebody in the corridor. You actually deliberately schedule just a quick, we're doing it with our team just now. Uh, we're all adjusting at this as well. Um, and just that check in, if you position coaching or coaching type conversations, corridor coaching conversations as helping somebody think something through and move to the next steps, it's as simple as that. And I think now more than ever, there's a need for that solution focused thinking because it can be so easy in the current situation for all sorts of reasons for us to spiral into problem focused thinking. And it's, it's really unproductive and it's unhealthy um, mentally. Uh, someone with a repertoire of solution focused strategies to help people move beyond the obstacles but to do that in small incremental steps when everything seems really overwhelming just now i can't think of a more pressing time where that those skills are needed and I, i'm not really bothered whether you set them up as formal coaching cycles coaching sessions there might still be a need for that and that can be done remotely um but those incidental conversations i think the thinking needs to move to how do i still create the opportunities for those to happen and maybe i don't run our weekly staff or team meeting the way we normally would maybe we run it as a series of mini coaching opportunities you know i think we're going to see this you're going to see this doing it now this week in victoria that school's not going to be the same and i think the best advice i've heard recently is don't expect it to be the same um that things will change and i don't mean things big things i mean the way we operate the way we interact the way we timetable our day that applies to everything, including those corridor conversations. Or, so how do you create those opportunities? If those were of value, how can you reinitiate them or, or generate them? And it might mean, it will mean, we need to stop doing some other things that we did just traditionally. Mm. And I think that's a healthy thing. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. All right, on that note, Chris Munro, thank you very much for your time. I've appreciated Great. hearing your thoughts. Thank you, Stephen.